Okay, um, so my name's Gareth Arbord. I work for the Metropolitan Police in their digital video forensics lab. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit today about some of the challenges and strategies for dealing with those challenges we have in dealing with video forensics. Um, so I personally head up a data recovery team, so we tend to sort of fix broken video mostly. Um, I started off in 2005 doing various broadcast technical roles and then about nine years ago moved over to um, video forensics because I found it quite interesting and I like the techie side and it's, uh, lots of puzzles to solve so that's kind of my, my sort of take on that. Uh, right, so I'm going to start with a cliche and try and define forensics a little bit. So really we're talking about applying scientific principles to collecting, examining and analysing evidence. So the sort of cornerstones should be really that your results should be reliable, repeatable and verifiable. And uh, by that I mean can we trust our results? Um, if, if I do the same test again, am I going to get the same result? Or if someone else does that test, will they get us the same result? And looking at perhaps why that might be, that difference might be there. And then verifiability. So can we actually check those results to, to verify that what we're looking at is, is the truth or what, what we assume to be correct? Okay. So uh, we're going to go through a few different things. We're going to go through the end state. So what's the goals of the actual work that we do in our lab? Um, we're going to look at... Um, uh, sorry. Uh, we're going to look at uh, what, what we do ourselves, um, different, different departments in the, within the lab, so we've got a few different bits to cover there. Uh, the diversity of the source and format, which is one of our biggest problems. Quantity, not quality. We get a lot of different video, so we'll talk a bit about that. And then acquisition, so how we get it from the different sources that we receive and ingest. So what do we do with it once we've got a sort of blob of data off a machine? Okay, so uh, one of the first things we're probably looking at is, is live intelligence. So let's say somebody's missing or we're trying to identify a suspect. So it's just about getting a quick, urgent viewing of whatever source. Uh, quite often a lot of the systems will have multiple cameras. So it's just about getting, getting whatever you're receiving working so a police officer can come and view it for, from our point of view. Uh, right, so then the, the other end state we go for is, is a much more long-term goal of getting the evidence ready for presentation in court. Uh, that often involves compiling multiple different sources of video rather than just one particular device. Um, and then the other thing we get a lot of is infrared sensors are quite attractive to spiders. So. This is, this is quite common, sort of eight hours of this in front of a critical camera. Uh, right, so next uh, I'm going to go through a bit about what we actually do within the lab, so some of our different sort of services. Uh, so there's this downloads and data recovery, which is what I do. So we look at physical data recovery and logical. So physical is in damaged media. I try and palm off as much of that as I can to the other lab because... I prefer them to deal with the, the myriad of problems that hard drives can cause, but I do deal with optical disks. Um, and then we've got the logical side, which I'll talk to about in a bit more detail later. Um, okay, yep, yeah, then we've got court compilation. So this requires taking all these different sources that we're receiving and, and trying to get them onto a timeline and exporting them in some sort of homogenous format, which, which can be quite trying. Um, and then we've got enhancement, which I'm sure you've all seen your crazy CSI man in a pair of glasses and being reflected, or you know, a lot of that's nonsense. We we can do a couple of cool tricks. Um, there's there's a trick called blind deconvolution. I think some of the astronomers use it where you, you try and correct for motion blur. Um, I won't go into the science of it now because it's not my specialism, but the other one that's quite fun playing with is frame averaging, where you can take multiple pretty terrible images of an object. And as long as you've got a vaguely static object in front of you, you can line them up and average them and come out with something a little bit better. Um, I was trying to get the text I've written on that bit of paper back. If you can see that little that line wasn't happening there, I went a bit too far with it. But um, sometimes you get good results with number plates with that sort of technique. OK, and then the other thing we do in the lab is comparison. So is the person in the reference image, which would be the, the big, nice, clear photo, 
the same as the person in the terrible sort of awful low res poor angled CCTV image. Um, they try and take a good scientific approach to it in the lab and it's, it involves a lot of work and they've done a lot of research into it over the last few years to get really tighten up their processes and sort of take a scientific approach to that. So yeah, so you've got these three strands that we work towards. We work towards downloads, enhancement, comparison, and court compilation. So moving on from there. Diversity of source and format. This is by far our biggest problem. So CCTV systems, there are hundreds of these things, probably thousands. No uniformity amongst them. They have different codecs, different, different resolutions, different standards. Most of them are rushed to market very quickly, so a lot of them don't particularly work very well either. Um, so that's a huge obstacle for us. Uh, you've got mobile devices, lots of mobile devices out there at the moment, many of them creating quite non-conformant bit streams as well in the sense of um, there's, there's been a big problem with H.264 that we had over the last few years where a lot of them don't spe uh, specify the color range correctly, so whether they're using limited or full range, and we found a lot of the times that like people were trying to enhance video without awareness of this, and you found that they would just completely clip out the blacks. And you've got, I think it was Motorola were quite bad for this, where they were li specifically labeling their bit streams using uh, limited range when it was in fact using full, so a lot of our tools were automatically throwing that information away until we sort of came across it. Uh, the other big problem with mobiles is people tend to deliver the material by social media, so email or WhatsApp and everything ends up horrifically compressed and comes to us and it's like, hey, we got the video, but it's just, you know, like two pixels wide and rubbish. Uh, then we've got dashboard cameras, which have probably come into proliferation, especially in the last few years. These are a nightmare as well because they come with their own metadata, which means they also come with their own players. So burying down to that metadata can be quite troublesome for us. The other problem as well is because they're using SD cards that aren't really up to the job. These SD cards are left in these devices. They're recording long, long time, especially like a taxi that might be driving in their car for a long portion of the day. And the SD cards are often quite badly hammered by the time they come to us. Um, so what can we do with all these different formats? Well, certainly Media Info is an amazing tool that we use a lot. Um, FF Probe, Exif tool, really good starting point. When you've, got, when you've actually managed to acquire the data and you've got it in front of you, this is a great, really saves my life tool. Um, and then we've also got the old legacy formats that tend to come to us as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that because I think you guys are pretty well covered on that. Uh, oh, the only thing I would mention actually relating to the previous talk about the closed captions was we do have one slightly different format that you guys might not come across too much, which is a multiplexed VHS where people use uh, a custom device to multiplex multiple cameras into a single VHS tape. So they effectively do like camera one and they'll be using the vertical blanking to encode camera number and timestamp. And so we have like a big bank in our lab of custom, well, not custom, but of old, these old devices that used to be used in, in situ because we do still get old tapes coming in sometimes. Uh, right, so proprietary codecs, proprietary file systems. The DVRs make up a new file system pretty much every time they make one. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep abbreviating DVRs. I mean the, the CCTV systems, the digital video recorders. Um, so they, they have hundreds of different weird file systems that have no like uh, documentation out there. Uh, very old media containers, the CCTV systems produce a different file format each time pretty much. Proprietary replay software, very difficult to work with and unpredictable data integrity. Um, so, okay, so a bit about the amount we're, de we're dealing with as well. So let's say um, that a lot of uh, vendors try and go for this mystical 28 days of video. So uh, average two terabyte disk in a system, recording for 28 days, let's say it's an eight camera system. So we're dealing with about 5,000 hours of video on a single disk. Um, and you're probably dealing with 400 kilobyte video, which is not great. So sort of, you know, you've got manufacturers selling a unit saying it's a 1080p unit, but you get a quality like this out of it. So it's, it's a bit sort of defeats the point somewhat. Um, ideally, you'd be getting it around the sort of 2000 limit, but 
works. That's never going to happen. It's complete luck of the draw. Sometimes you will get that. Other times you'll get as low as 200. Now, the problem with that is you've got all these different resolutions and all these different bit rates. And that leads to this problem. So the way the DVRs cope with recording all this data is when a disk fills up, it doesn't simply stop. It starts deleting the oldest material and writing back over it. So if you've got a very high resolution system with lots of cameras, that overwrite cycle is going to be very short. So you might even be talking about three days. So you, all, you, you know, no time to wait and everything. This is maybe like a three-day um, capture period where you've got to get the unit, turn it off, and bring it somewhere to get the data out. So you're working at quite sort of short deadlines sometimes. Other times, it's great. They said it's a motion record and. Uh, you might have a few months, but it's, it's completely variable, so there's no way to really predict it. Um, we can't keep everything, because if we kept everything, we'd have, have to have our own storage archive, and we just don't have capacity for that. So we target the clips we're working with, and we clone data by exception. So if it gets to me and I'm doing data recovery stuff, I'm going to work from a clone, because I'm going to hammer the disk with all sorts of code. But Otherwise, we, tr we actually work from a live device, which is kind of a bit of a no-no for digital forensics. But we have to because a lot of the time, you're, you're kind of mercy to the custom export that the DVR provides. Uh, OK, so then we're going to move on to a bit more about that. So we've got different levels of work where we are. So the, the Met is ridden with, sorry, the, the London is ridden with, piece, with um, CCTV. So we probably, I think, I, d I tried to do a little quick search, and they think there's about 600,000 CCTV cameras just in London alone. So it's a lot of, a lot to deal with. Uh, um, so initially, if there's a problem and we need video, the officer, police officers will try and do it. Then you've got a, a group called the Vido, which are specially trained police officers. They will try and acquire the video if the standard police officers can't. And then if no one else can do that, uh, the top 5% comes to the lab to be dealt with. Um, so like I say, out of all the different sources, CCTV is the hardest, and it's the, the file systems and the front panel DVR extraction that is, is the hardest thing to deal with. The other problem we have is there are very few extraction tools dedicated to dealing with the raw hard disks. There are a couple, but they're quite young products, and they don't yet really cover, uh, certainly not the older systems that we get. So they're getting there, but not there yet. So what do you get? So when you, when you go to do a download from a DVR, you'll get some sort of screen a bit like this, it's always very sort of, you quite often you'll find that there's like a normal, which is like standard recording alarm, which might mean motion, or motion, which might mean motion. So the, the terminology is very interchangeable. They just sort of make it up as they go along. Um, so you disable the overwrite as soon as you turn a unit on, which is to say to stop it trying to record over the oldest stuff, and then it makes it a little bit safer to work on the live system. And the first thing we try and work out is just is it on there. Um, OK, so then we're dealing with uh, a lot of legacy hardware. So we try and keep our legacy peripherals. It's quite important. So if a, if a USB stick is less than two gigs, I shove it in my drawer and I keep it and I scream at people who come near me for them. Um, so and I've got, I've got like weird USB mail to USB mail cables in there and all sorts of things that I, I harvest and hoard like a little troll. Um, so uh, the broken ones, so like I said before, inherently we deal with the toughest 5%, so most of what we get sent is probably broken in some way or another. Um, like I say, a lot of the DVRs are rushed out the door and the software on them is usually terrible. So you might find, it's hardware as well actually, so you might find like a power supply on one of them is awful. So as soon as you plug a USB stick in the front panel, it drops the voltage and the whole thing comes crashing down. So a lot of problems like that. Um, so when we do extract the hard disk and we start looking at the data, we use a Tableau uh, usually. Um, any write blocker that's been sort of verified will do. It doesn't have to be Tableau. It's just it's what we're using at the moment. Um, so then normally I'll go and start looking at, it, at the data in a hex reader. It's the only way to do it. If you've got a, just a, an empty, shiny disk, which sometimes people think they're being helpful by bringing you a completely no-context hard disk to you. Um, which is fun. Um, so I'll start looking normally for uh, MPEG markers. Luckily, a lot of the units are using H.264 now, so I don't know the sort of hex aware amongst you might recognize the, um, 
the 00167s, which you tend to get at the top of an iframe of H.264. Then what I normally do is once I find anything that looks like a codec I recognize, you'll find there's about 30 to 50 bytes before it, which is usually the proprietary CCTV system data. If you're very lucky, you'll find a marker like the one I've highlighted in yellow that repeats at a set interval before each frame. Um, and then, then what I do is normally I've got a bit of code I wrote to um, take samples based on markers, so then I'll line, align the data, which makes it a lot easier to read. So you just take a sample from the beginning of each frame, um, and then you start trying to sort of put the pieces together. So I've highlighted a couple of, a couple of columns there. The, First one in red, I think, is the size marker, simply because if you look on the left, you can see the offset for that frame. It looks similar, it's not quite the same, but it's quite often they work from a particular offset on the disk, so the, the frames don't always reference zero, sometimes they'll reference a, a section further down the disk after an index table. Uh, so once you've got that, you'll be looking at things like camera number, and the only way to test a lot of this data is to take actual frames out throw them into FFmpeg, decode them, and see, and if you're really lucky, there'll be an on-screen on display. Um, here's a couple of other things I've done. So it's all about annotation. So once you've got, once you've worked out a system, you start annotating. So here's another CCTV system. Um, luckily, some of them use like epoch time and dates, which is the sort of Unix timestamp. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them don't. A lot of them make up their own ones. We've got a little list of about I think it's about 30 odd completely made up timestamps they've, they've sort of invented for a single DVR. Um, here was some work I did on an MP4, which goes back to, I think, the talk from this morning or before lunch, before lunch, I think it was, um, where this was a move atom that had been corrupted. And luckily, we had a sample file from the vol header. This was from an MPEG 4 file rather than H.264. MPEG-4 is much easier to work with because you can reverse engineer if the iframe header is missing, but H.264 is a whole different ball game. But um, this was, I think we had to rebuild the index by mapping the MDAT section of the MP4 again. It is doable, it's, it's hard work, but it is doable. Um, you just have to look for patterns and deal with your codec at the time, so it's a bit of a piecemeal process. Um, and this was just for research. Um, this is an AVI header. So there's a lot of information in there, and it was actually, you didn't need to deal with almost any of it. It was just the top two fields, the file size was wrong, and I think the number, total number of frames was wrong, and fixing that pretty much repaired the file. So sometimes you can sort of take shortcuts to fixing things. But I just put that there because I'm showing off, really. Um, so, right, so acquisitions, I find the footage. So we're dealing with a lot of footage and a lot of data. So. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I found the, the marker, and then I found the timestamp, and I've got a little scanner that will then pass every single timestamp and turn it into human readable text, which means then you can check against the frames and work out if the data you're looking for is actually on there. I scanned a four terabyte disk and took a sample of the timestamp of every frame on it. It produced a 27 gigabyte CSV file, which was just massive. So. It's a lot of data to wade through, so then we had to filter that in turn. So, you know, your command line tools are almost invaluable here because a lot of data programs just won't open files that big. So, um, extremely useful. Um, I think I just used Find on CMD to do that, which worked surprisingly well. Uh, right, so let me just scroll down a bit. Okay, so. Um, then, once you've got a bit of an idea of the, the timestamps on the disk, you can then start to get, build up a picture of the structure of the disk as well. So the structure is quite important, because so you might have uh, a system that's going like camera one, two, three, four, or you might have half an hour, a chunk of half an hour allocated for camera one, then a chunk for, for camera two, and it might go down in chunks like that. So every disk is going to be different with that. Or you, you might be dealing with some sort of horrific fragmentation. I had a horrible one um, last year that was um, an XFS file system, which is quite fragmented, but it was a very strange old one that none of our tools would actually recognize. So it's sometimes, sometimes it's a sort of curse and a blessing when you get an actual file system to deal with. Uh, but yeah, so I, I mostly code in C Sharp, which is probably not sort of like a lot of people prefer Python, but I inherited C Sharp libraries and uh, learned to code on the job. Oh, am I hitting time?
So how do we, once we've actually got video off, um, so I'm just going to talk about what happens when we get the files out of the DVRs themselves in their native format. Um, so generally when I'm carving, to, in the previous step, I'd have just ripped out H.264 and then thrown it into FFmpeg, whereas this is what we would do if we've got uh, one of the many myriad files that comes out of a DVR. There are lots and they are all rubbish, um, without question. Uh, you've got .dav, .264, which could be literally anything. You've got .mp4s, which are complete lies. They are not mp4s. They're just made-up rubbish that's called itself .mp4. <laughs> Infinite trash. Uh, so um, I do feel strongly about this. So yeah, so here's an example of some of the players we get to deal with. Uh, the, the worst type of ones you deal with are when you get uh, a single file that has lots of cameras embedded within it. Uh, you can guarantee those aren't going to work very well normally. Um, and most of the players, if you do try and export a single camera, it will either transcode or crash normally. Um, okay, so one way we deal with that is screen capture. So it's, it's not great. I don't like screen capturing personally, but sometimes you have to. Um, we've got some weird old codecs that nothing will play back, like um, analog devices used to do some slightly more obscure wavelet type ones, and there's a weird one called SMACM, I don't know where that came from. Um, and GeoVision used to have like a whole cluster of slightly modified codecs that were sort of like GX264 and things like that. Uh, so we take our player, we render it on the desktop, we screen grab, and we capture it as a raw RGB. Pros of screen capture, it's a pretty simple process. You don't need to be too technical to do it. You open a player, hit go. It's more city capture area, hit go, and then you're kind of done. And the bonus is a lot of these players will have their own overlay of text. So they might say the camera number or the timestamp, which they're decoding internally. Um, luckily, they've moved away from that a bit, but we still get enough legacy systems for that to still be an issue. Uh, so, yeah, you've got lots of cons. You've got an unavoidable um, color space conversion. So if you're dealing with enhancement, it's kind of a no-go, really. Um, <coughs> dropped frames, because you're dealing with quite high bandwidth, especially if you're trying to capture one of the more modern, like, 4K systems. It's not great. Scaling issues. Um, it also means you're junking up your workstation PC with these infinite numbers of, of executables sometimes installing direct show codecs that should have been buried in the ground many a year ago. Um, okay, you've got to deal with it in real time, so if you're dealing with lots of footage, that's a problem. And um, you then still have to go and transcode that before you hit your editor because you have to conform your file because quite a lot of the time CCTV is working at odd frame rates and our screen capture tool captures each frame as it appears rather than st at a set frame rate. Um, okay, so... Um, transcoding, on the other hand, uh, I, I usually prefer this. You take a file, you throw it into FFmpeg. You might need to use the forcing flag, so the minus F before the input file name, to force to H.264. That has saved my life so many times, I cannot count. Uh, and then at the moment, we're going to lossless H.264, uh, which I'm sure lots of people will say is not a good idea. It's certainly not great for editing with, but until FFv1 becomes sort of edit compatible, I don't think we're... I think we, some people are arguing about us moving back to ProRes, and I'm still standing my ground, but we'll see. Um, all right, so where are we? Uh, so we can maintain the color space if we transcode, hopefully. It's less vulnerable to clipping if you stay in the YUV space. Um, we're less likely to crop the image edges, so sometimes with the, the players, they will trim out the edges of what you're playing back, which is pretty bad. Um, there is no reason CCTV should ever be interlaced, but some of it is, and it's just death of me. So yeah, that FFM is better at dealing with that. Um, it's faster than real time, mostly, and you don't have to deal with the executables. There's a lot of, a lot of pros, but not everything's compatible. It can't catch the overlays, and um, timing can be lost. So sometimes if you're forcing, it loses all the sense of timing, and you'll get the file that just goes whoosh, like that from A to B. So you'll then have to manually do something like FF Play to diagnose it, count against the OSD on the number of seconds, and then rewrap it again with the seconds, um, sort of calculated into the file. 
there's sort of different approaches to that. That's, that's what I would do. And the other, the other thing we do is rewrapping. So sometimes it can be enough to take one of the native files, rewrap it into something like an MP4 or an AVI, and then uh, you transcode. Um, sorry, uh, so you can do that as a pre-stage to transcoding, which can sometimes make things easier. Um, trial and error involved in all of this, and uh, sometimes rewrapping can help with the, uh, the time code errors. So I think I'm almost wrapping up now. So currently, uh, our ingest is, yeah, like I said, it's H.264 um, lossless. We conform to 30 frames a second. We now scale everything to 1080p. Um, and then, just for fun, we master to a DNX mov and distribute as an H.264 MP4. The reason we do that last stage is because we're using Adobe Premiere at the moment, and it's awful for exporting chapter markers. So we're sort of forced to go via the mov and then use FFmpeg to keep those chapter markers. Because if you export a native MP4 from it, you can't keep your chapter markers. Um, which is probably a conversation for another day, but there's very little in the way of chapter marking and menu systems made available for video now, unless you want to be sort of stuck with HTML replay. Uh, so then it goes to the court system. That's also problematic, so it leaves us. We give it to an officer, they take it away, and then it goes through a horrible wireless streaming service that degrades live, ca live encodes on a laptop and turns what sort of rubbish video you've got into like a pile of something you'd probably not want to slip on. And um, we do have an in-house in -house presentation team um, who try and educate officers on how to present in court, and they have their own bit of software that, that's kind of a nice multimedia mix, so you can present PDFs and videos and audio in the same place. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up there. Thank you. Couple minutes for questions, and we'll start over here with the remote. First question from Samaya. Curious to know if there's a good mobile device that is producing video that's okay quality and not a nightmare to deal with the digital video files afterwards. Assume not, but thought I'd ask. Um, I hate to say it, but Apple aren't that bad. And that's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> they do seem to label their bitstream correctly, so I can't be too cross at them. But, actually, but they do do one thing that's pretty bad, actually. They encode to H.265 under the hood, and if you put the wrong setting on your phone, they will live transcode that back to H.264 when you extract, so I can retract that. No, they're all a bit crap. And second question by Peter White. Acquisition levels. Surely you would need an image to work with evidence package due to the possibilities of accidental metadata changing when police officers attempt to acquire footage and fail? Well, it depends on the level you're working with at the time. So if you're dealing with, um, let's say, like non-critical evidence, so I don't know, like um, uh, shoplifting, something where, where the crime type isn't proportional enough to justify the lab resources because we are quite finite, then, then I think there's, there's an acceptable risk factor. I mean, it depends when you talk about metadata. I mean, in CCTV, a lot of the time, you're just looking for what's in the picture. Time codes are, I mean, there's a, it's a debate in itself, but the time codes are kind of unreliable anyway because you're dealing with, there's a lot of issues that can go wrong with time codes. So, you know, if you turn a system on and off, there's every chance the time code could jump or is it syncing against the internet? Or with modern IP systems, do you have you can have a camera that syncs against its own time clock, an MVR that syncs against its own time clock. So you can be dealing with multiple sources. So metadata, metadata in itself isn't entirely reliable. So I think as long as you've got the imagery you're interested in, that's key. Thank you. That's super interesting presentation. Thank you. I'm just curious. So in terms of like. That, that all of the transformations you're doing from like the point of acquisition to court presentation, like do you ever um, get challenges in terms of like the accuracy of what this all of this trans the, the whatever you're presenting in court is and whether it truly reflects you know what was originally captured by the CCTV camera and then is it just a matter of like expert testimony or like having a documented process or like how do you affirm that? Well. Yeah, as it stands, we don't get challenged very often on it. The, the main challenges come with the comparison work because that does require a, a 
strong degree of training to you know, assert that you've got a degree of confidence over whether someone is the same in one picture as another. That's, that's I think, the biggest area, and the enhancement work as well. The enhancement work, obviously, is more questionable. But a lot of the time, I think, people tend to believe what they've got in front of them, which I think, as you were talking about earlier with the authenticity, I think is going to become more of a problem in the future because I think imagery is going to become more, more, uh, more easily compromised and more easy to challenge. I think that the bonus with CCTV is that is actually quite hard because you've got to, you know, you've got to jump into like a 24-hour recording and, and do it quite seamlessly. And I, I think it'd be interesting as a challenge to run actually to try and see if people could do it and, and what the effect and what the results of that would be. But again, people at work won't let me do that because they think I'm, a, I'm setting, the, setting up myself up for trouble. So. <laughs> David Pruger. I've heard that there are systems who save space by dropping frames over time. Is that, is that not usual anymore? Um, it's unfortunately some of the council systems actually do that and what they do is they have a system that it like from an engineering point of view it's clever but from an evidential point of view it's ridiculous so what they do is they save their I frames, P frames and B frames in separate files and they will drop, first of all they'll drop the B frames like on week two and then week three they'll drop the predicted frames, and then week four they'll do the lot. So that can happen. 